House of Lords Select Committee on the Constitution. Uh, and today we're looking at the use and scrutiny of emergency powers during the pandemic. And our witnesses are Baroness Hale of Richmond and Lord Sumption. So good morning to both our witnesses and, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to start off in general terms. We'll go into some detail later. Uh, but in general terms, can you give us your overall approach to how you think uh, the government has fared during its use of emergency powers in this pandemic? And in particular, can you also talk about how Parliament has been able to respond and fulfil its responsibilities in terms of scrutinising the legislation that the government has brought forward? Um, who would like to start? Shall I start? Baroness Hale, do you want to start? Yes, please. Well, I would like to make it clear that I express absolutely no view on the substance of the regulations that the government has made. Um, I don't have uh, views about that. I don't regard myself as qualified. What I do think I have some uh, qualification to express views on is the process by which those regulations were made. And in relation to the first regulations, uh, the obvious problem with them is that they were introduced when Parliament was in recess. They did not have to be introduced when Parliament was in recess but it meant that Parliament had no opportunity to debate them for several weeks. What's happened since then is a bewildering flurry of new regulations coming in um, at very short notice. Usually Parliament has had time for a short debate, but only a short debate. And the difficulty with that is partly the bewildering rapidity with which the regulations have been changed, uh, the difficulty of studying the regulations uh, adequately in order to debate them properly, and of course Parliament only has the all or nothing, yes or no um, uh, option uh, in dealing with the regulations. The normal orderly process of scrutinising delegated legislation has not taken place. I think there are ways in which it could have taken place, uh, but we'll get on to that later. Thank you. Lord Sampson. Um, I uh, agree with all of that. Uh, I think that the, uh, the process had an extremely rocky start. Um, the point made uh, by Lady Hale uh, about the circumstances in which the first regulations were introduced uh, without uh, uh, parliamentary scrutiny for seven weeks uh, uh, is a particular source of concern because it is reasonably clear that that was a deliberate decision. But the reason why I say that uh, is that the, the regulations were announced by the Prime Minister on the 23rd of March. Uh, they were said to be so urgent that Parliament couldn't be consulted. Statements were made in the House of Commons to the effect uh, that the regulations were already in force, which they were not. And there was a delay, in spite of the professed urgency, of three days until the 26th at 1 p.m., when the regulations were duly made. Now, that may strike one as a petty fogging point um, uh, from the broader political and clinical point of view. Constitutionally, it's, I think, quite a serious matter. Clearly, since then, there has been a considerable improvement uh, in that, as a result of political pressure rather than constitutional scruple, uh, the government has allowed a wider measure of consultation than it originally envisaged. Uh, in particular, the second lockdown was introduced on a basis which, although it was based on the Public Health Act, uh, was consistent with the procedure that would have been followed under the Civil Contingencies Act. In other words, it lasted uh, for less than 30 days, and parliamentary approval was sought in advance and not some time uh, in arrears. There has been some reversion to type with the latest set of regulations, which have a duration of two months, but they have been at least discussed in advance in the chamber of both houses. 
Do you think that the failing was on the part of Parliament, or was it because of the way the government had actually gone about uh, dealing with um, the, uh, getting the uh, emergency powers that it felt it wanted? Well, in the case of the March regulations, um, there was nothing that Parliament could do because it was in recess, uh, and uh, the Parliament cannot recall itself, uh, so it was effectively stymied. Uh, whether the result, if it had been consulted, would have been any different. March was uh, the height of the alarm about the, the uh, virus, uh, and uh, I very much doubt whether the result would have been any different. Uh, but I certainly think that it is desirable uh, that governments should have to explain, uh, produce evidence in support of uh, drastic decisions which they make, and the best, and certainly the most constitutional way of doing that, is for them to face the scrutiny of not only committees, but the full chamber of both houses. Um, and that is something, the absence of which has significantly reduced the actual quality of lawmaking. Baroness Hale, do you want to add anything? No, I, I agree with uh, all of that. Okay, in that case, let's go on to uh, some of the uh, detail there. Uh, Lord Panic. Uh, good morning. Um, can I ask each of you whether you think there was any good reason for the government not to use the powers in the Civil Contingencies Act uh, uh, earlier this year, or at least replicate the provisions of that Act, which uh, did require, do require, regulations only to last for 30 days and perhaps more importantly and exceptionally uh, the powers under that act uh, um, allow each house of parliament to amend regulations and not just mm. yes or no would you like me to deal with that yes please um, i think the basic problem uh, is that under the terms of the civil contingencies act um, uh, uh, it, is, it can be used only if no other statutory power exists. Now, my yes. own view is, but this is not a view that is uh, uh, universally shared, my own view is that the Public <coughs> Health Act does not, in fact, authorise uh, the restrictions that have been imposed on people who are not reasonably supposed to have the virus, and not thought to be infectious. I don't believe it was intended to justify what has been done. The Court of Appeal, in a judgment given yesterday in the Simon Dolan Judicial Review, uh, rejected that argument, uh, and uh, I understand that an application is to be made for leave to appeal uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, the, the basic uh, problem uh, is that the powers in the Public Health Act, uh, as far as concerns non-infectious uh, are in wholly general terms and on ordinary constitutional principle, so-called principle of legality, that would not be treated as justifying the curtailment of fundamental rights. Uh, I uh, make no comment on the merits of the Court of Appeals decision, although I have certain views about that. Uh, the, but I think that the point of principle is very clear. The framework in the Civil Contingencies Act is specifically designed to deal with cases of national emergency where it may be thought appropriate to govern by decree, which essentially is what has been happening uh, for the last uh, eight or nine months. It is precisely because of the drastic nature of those rights that there is an exceptional level of parliamentary scrutiny provided for. It seems to me absolutely clear that the nature of the powers that have been exercised is such that, that parliamentary scrutiny on the level provided for in the Civil Contingencies Act is extremely desirable for all the reasons that you, Lord Panic, uh, have, uh, have pointed out. Uh, I think that attention should be in due course given to modifying the legislation uh, in order to produce that result. But I certainly think that it would have been constitutionally appropriate for the government to replicate the effect of the Civil Contingencies Act, whatever the statutory origin of their powers. Uh, Baroness Hale. 
Well, I was going to say exactly the same reason uh, that Lord Sumption has said uh, why the government um, used the Public Health Act rather than the Civil Contingencies Act. It's actually in section 21, subsection 5 uh, of the Civil Contingencies Act that they're not allowed to use it uh, uh, unless the existing legislation cannot be relied upon without risk of serious delay. I don't want to express any view on the issue that may very well be coming before the Supreme Court as to whether the Public Health Act does in fact uh, allow uh, the control of the activities of healthy people to the extent that the regulations have been made. But I do agree that the constitutional protections that there are in the Civil Contingencies Act are more appropriate than the uh, lack of protection that there is in the Public Health Act. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord Panic, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, ju just to ask uh, our witnesses wh whether they would agree that it is likely there would always be some measure of doubt as to whether existing legislation confers uh, uh, powers speedily enough. And therefore, the Civil Contingencies Act, with that exception, becomes useless. Government's always going to want to avoid uncertainty in this area. And I wonder whether Baroness Hale would agree with Lord Sumption that there's a strong case for modifying the Civil Contingencies Act um, to ensure it is used, there is an emergency of this nature. And as Hale, do you want to respond yes, to I that invitation? I yes, I think I would agree with that, uh, Lord Panic. Yeah. Um, yes, I think I would agree with that, uh, Lord Panic. Uh, it would involve um, amending the Civil Contingencies Act, but you'd also have to deal with the possibility that the government would nevertheless choose to use other legislation, which it regarded as more convenient uh, and um, subject to whether the Public Health Act uh, does operate in, in this area in the way that it's been used. It's undoubtedly more convenient because it involves less um, parliamentary scrutiny in um, cases of urgency. Thank you. Uh, Lord Beath. Uh, you're muted still, Lord Beath. Sorry, you're still muted. I think you pressed the button twice. That's it. Right. I think at the time of the debates on the Coronavirus Act, most of us would have been surprised if we had been told that it wasn't that act, but the Public Health Act that was going to be used. Mm -hmm. And there was an argument about whether it should be the Civil Contingencies Act, even at that time. But the uh, possibility of the Public Health Act being used was, I think, not in the discussion or debate. And I, I certainly took the view, once it was used, that it was a strange use of it because its powers appeared to relate particularly to situations where you could make a judgment that somebody was likely to be infectious and act according to that judgment. Do you, do you think there was any, any wider awareness that the government would uh, get out the old statute book and use the Public Health Act 1984 as amended as the basis. But I certainly don't remember that. Do either of our witnesses remember? Lord, um, I have no recollection of... Sorry? Please I continue. have no yes. recollection of... Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I have no recollection of there being any mention of the Public Health Act at the time. Um, and my guess is, but you parliamentarians will know better than I, uh, that you will have thought that the provisions in the Coronavirus Act were aimed at dealing with controlling individuals and controlling events and activities. But they are in Scotland and Wales. But the ones in the Coronavirus Act, yes, but the ones in the um, Coronavirus Act are limited to people who are infectious or potentially infectious. And I expect, but I don't know, that when Parliament was voting on that, it expected that it would be either those powers or the um, contin civil contingencies powers that would be used. And they had no uh, inkling that the public health powers would be used. That's only my suspicion. I don't know. Uh, Lord Sumption. Uh, well, uh, I have read the uh, debates, which were, of course, extremely truncated. The Coronavirus Act went through 
all its stages in each house single day. Um, and uh, there is, so far as I can see, no reference at all to the Public Health Act. Uh, as Baroness Hale points out, uh, Schedules 21 and 22 of the Coronavirus Act, which are the relevant schedules, apart from the fact that they're tucked away in the part of the Act which perhaps uh, legislators in a hurry wouldn't turn to first, um, they, uh, they are limited powers. They basically are the classic powers which for centuries states, including the United Kingdom, have exercised in the case of epidemics, power to isolate and control the movements uh, of um, uh, people that are thought to be infectious. The only power which may be wider than that is the power conferred uh, in Schedule 21 and 22 to control gatherings, uh, an expression which is unfortunately not defined in the Act. Okay. Do either of our witnesses think that there is a, a new legal basis upon which the necessary powers could be or should be placed? No assumption. Do you mean uh, uh, under new legislation? Yes, yes. Uh, well, yes, there is. Um, uh, I think that one possibility uh, would be to amend the, the Civil Contingencies Act in the way uh, that both Baroness Hale and I have suggested. Uh, but I think that because the government may choose to use an act with the minimum of parliamentary scrutiny, it is actually highly desirable uh, that the Public Health Act should also be amended so as, first of all, to uh, remove the powers that it confers uh, uh, or may be thought to confer in relation to healthy people so that those powers can then only be exercised under the Civil Contingencies Act. Uh, secondly, to introduce into the Public Health Act in cases where powers are being exercised in relation to healthy people, uh, procedural safeguards comparable to those in the Coronavirus Act. And thirdly, although this third point may be more debatable, uh, to require uh, the production uh, in support of any regulations made under the amended Act uh, of a proper impact assessment uh, of the kind which some statutes, notably in environmental legislation, uh, require in other contexts. Um, Baroness Hale, do you want to add anything? No, I don't, because I'm in sympathy with everything <clears throat> Lord Sumption has said on this point, yes. Excuse me for my sudden departure, because uh, there was a, a, a vital delivery of um, essential <laughs> supplies to my back door, so I had to go and receive it, but forgive me. <laughs> I think we've all been in that situation. <clears throat> Lord Beath, did you have anything uh, um, you wanted to I'm very happy with those responses. Thank you. Uh, Baroness Drake. Morning. Um, Baroness Hale, in reply to a previous com uh, question from uh, Baroness Taylor, you commented that uh, there were better ways in which Parliament could have scrutinised regulations which could have taken place. Could you, could you share further your thinking on that point with us? Baroness well, Hale? I, I believe I recall that that was in the con... Sorry. I recall that that was in the context of the first set of lockdown regulations which had no parliamentary scrutiny at all for several weeks and of course they could have been introduced in such a way as to give them at least the level of parliamentary scrutiny that there has subsequently been for the second set of lockdown regulations and for the all tiers regulations uh, that came into force today. That's what I was referring to. And in terms of the uh, current situation, what should Parliament's scrutiny of emergency powers be looked like, look like at this stage of the pandemic? Um, Baroness Hale or Lord Sumption, who would like to come in first? Lord Sumption. There is a, obviously there are time constraints uh, which uh, may limit, for example, the ability of um, specialist committees to look at the question, which would, I think, be much the most desirable way, a bit more practicable, which I rather fear it may not be. Um, I think that 
um, that some kind of committee investigation, even if it were abbreviated, uh, would be extremely desirable uh, to provide um, a, a somewhat less partial uh, view of what is involved uh, for the benefits of those voting on these measures in the chamber. Baroness Hale. I don't know whether this is the correct time uh, at which to make a point which has occurred to me in this whole um, difficult situation. Uh, we understand the huge complexities of trying to deal with the, the pandemic and how hard it is to make the choices uh, that have to be made. But what strikes me is that the first lockdown, which went on from March until July, was a time when the government could have provided a framework, a settled framework, which everybody would understand and which uh, then could be applied from time to time as appropriate and even from place to place as appropriate. Uh, I have in mind uh, what was done in the Republic of Ireland, where they have a five level um, framework uh, of um, rules and regulations as to what people can and cannot do, which everybody knows, everybody understands, and they move between it. Uh, and if such a plan had been formulated, we would not have had this constant chopping and changing between different levels of control. Now, I'm not making a point about the substance of that. I am making a point about how difficult it is, uh, both for you in Parliament and indeed for the courts to assess the um, to assess in the courts the validity and for you in Parliament to assess the wisdom uh, of what is being done. Uh, a proper framework would have made your lives much easier. Mm. Lord Sampson? Um, I entirely agree with that. I think that the problem actually may uh, have arisen at a much earlier stage than the outbreak of this particular epidemic. Um, Major pandemics have been top of the National Risk Register since it was first published in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been, we know this because a number of interim reports, notably in 2011, were produced, a fair amount of civil service contingency planning uh, that exercise what might be done about it. Uh, it seems to me that one problem here is that there has been a distinct failure which I think is at least partly down to the civil service, uh, to produce contingency plans for the kind of measures that the government envisaged. Now, I don't know the reason for that, or the government, but the government has applied. I don't know the reason for that, but I suspect that the reason is that until March, uh, it was thought to be unthinkable uh, that the government would generally lock down the population. That is, I think, a fair assumption from, first of all, the fact that the 2011 report into contingency arrangements uh, uh, expressed it as government policy uh, that uh, the object should be to maintain normal life as far as possible, um, and partly from the fact that the minutes of SAGE indicates that there was no discussion of the possibility of a general lockdown until it happened. Um, that but whatever the historical explanation, it seems to me that the absence of any kind of contingency planning explains both the absence of a framework uh, at any stage until relatively recently of this crisis. It also, uh, I, I think, explains uh, the reason why there has not been a, a proper impact assessment, uh, because the uh, equipment, the templates that would normally be produced before such a crisis ever broke out simply weren't there. Uh, Baron Strait, did you want to follow up at all? No, I'm conscious of other questions to come. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Howe, <clears throat> I think you wanted to uh, come in on, perhaps on your uh, Commissioner. So, uh, um, uh, uh, good morning. Um, you, you, you were both talking earlier about um, scrutiny by 
the full chamber or by specialist committees. Of course, the fact of the matter is that the full chambers have not been full during the um, crisis at all. They've been almost empty or very, very, <coughs> very thinly populated benches and rather a curious atmosphere developing. Do you think, in fact, that the specialist committees uh, could have taken a much bigger role? I mean, we've had plagues before, pandemics, but this is the first one in history in a fully digitalized society with uh, the general populace enormously empowered and connected in a way that's never happened before. Could not the committee ambience be a far better one for really pursuing this cascade of regulations and pressing ministers to provide answers and answers again, and officials as well, in a way that the chamber simply can't deliver? Uh, and how would these additional powers for these specialist committees uh, be developed? Can you have some thoughts on that? Who would like to go first? I'm happy to, uh, just to fill the silence. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that the chamber serves an important function. Uh, obviously, it's different from the committee function. The committees are the best place to consider evidence and to deal uh, with expert input into this kind of problem. But the chamber has an absolutely essential function, especially in the House of Commons, um, where uh, notwithstanding uh, party discipline, there can be no mistaking the atmosphere uh, which uh, reigns behind a minister whose decisions are suspected or disliked. I think that constitutionally, that is what has enabled the chamber, particularly in the House of Commons, to operate as a national sounding board in a way that I personally regard as profoundly healthy for democracy. For that reason, I think it's very unfortunate that social distancing has been applied in the chambers of both houses. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a dilemma here. Does the high constitutional calling of parliamentarians uh, prevail over their concerns, understandable concerns about their health or not. Uh, I gave evidence recently to the Irish Parliament on broadly similar questions. And one of the striking things about Ireland is that it is unconstitutional to limit access to the chamber. And there was a considerable debate uh, among the committee before whom I was giving evidence about whether this was a satisfactory state of affairs. The debate being between those who felt that the duties, the constitutional duties prevailed over everything, and those who felt uh, that it was uh, important that parliament should give an example of distancing to the public at large. Uh, I think this is a dilemma. I personally do not think that, that a three quarters empty uh, chamber uh, with a mode of access to it somewhat resembling uh, an LBC phone-in programme is a terribly satisfactory arrangement. Uh, Baroness Hale. I don't really have any um, particular comment to, to make. Um, it, I agree with Lord Sumption that it is important to have both the detailed scrutiny in committees and the kind of more, I'm going to say, almost emotional um, mm. impact of um, what goes on in the chamber. I do think, judging by, I've been keeping an eye on what's been going on uh, in the House of Lords, uh, you do have hybrid proceedings in which people can participate uh, remotely. It doesn't give the same feel, but it does enable a lot more people to participate. Uh, and uh, I hope that that has been possible uh, and working as well as is, it, it can be done. I don't know about um, expecting parliamentarians uh, to um, behave in ways that are considered unsafe for other members of the public. I, I think that I would be reluctant to expect that of them. Dare I say it, particularly in the House of Lords, where the uh, average age is um, puts 
I suspect most members uh, into the vulnerable category. Indeed. Uh, Lord Howe. Yes, well, I mean, uh, the Chamber is, is a great show, isn't it? But I think someone once said that the Chamber was a, par a Parliament on show and the committees are a Parliament at work. But uh, here we are with this, um, uh, this uh, sea, this enormous quantity of very detailed regulations and guidance all jumbled up together. And um, a feeling that, <coughs> that uh, even a full chamber, let alone a half empty chamber, is not the best place for doing more than immolating, immolating certain ministers and their reputations may be, but not forgetting at, at all the very complex detail. Is there not a matter, a question of thinking about more powers, actual powers in our parliament from, in, placed in the hands of committees? Every other parliament, I think, in almost in the world, and certainly in the democracies, uh, does have a give power over the control of the agenda to the parliament. Um, we don't have that uh, control over our agenda, I think, as Lord Sumption has observed somewhere. Is, isn't there a time for some, if one's going to talk about what Parliament wants to do this and Parliament wants to do that, isn't it time to think about what we mean by Parliament? So there are many mansions in it and maybe some of the mansions need a bit of refurbishing. Uh, Lord Sumption. Well, uh, this is of course uh, a, a very fundamental issue and a much broader one uh, than uh, is I think envisaged by the agenda of your committee at the moment. But I entirely agree uh, and, uh, with the point that has been made. Uh, we are virtually the only parliament in the world. I believe the same is true of the New Zealand parliament. Uh, but I'm not aware of any other case, uh, in, and this was also apparent during the debates over Brexit last year, uh, I'm not aware of any other case where parliament has no control over the agenda. There isn't a business of the House Committee, uh, and there is no procedure by which a minimum number of uh, parliamentarians can require a matter to be debated if they feel strongly enough to put their name down. I believe that the control of the agenda, primarily by the executive, uh, but also to some extent by uh, the speaker and the, the Lord Speaker, uh, is a very serious constitutional anomaly. It worked fine at a time when there was much more of a shared parliamentary culture about making the system work according to the spirit of it and not just the letter than there is now. But the disappearance of that culture, which will be hard to recreate, I think makes it extremely important that attention should be given to this. Uh, Baroness Hale, um, slightly out with what we were talking about earlier, but would you like to comment? Well, I have every sympathy for what both Lord Howell and Lord Sumption have been saying. Thank you. Uh, Baroness Corston. Thank you. Continuing the discussion of Parliament's role and scrutiny, what lessons can be learned from the government's preparation and Parliament's scrutiny of the measures introduced in response to the pandemic? What should be done differently the next time there's a need for substantial emergency legislation? Um, Lord Sumption, uh, you've touched on this. Do you want to expand a little? Uh, no, I think I have uh, addressed that in answers to earlier questions. I think we need to review the statutory framework. We need to review the procedural framework in both Houses of Parliament. Uh, and uh, it would be desirable, but I fear unrealistic, uh, to look for a, a more cooperative approach from government to the proper functions of parliament uh, than has been uh, forthcoming from the present government uh, and its immediate predecessor going back about two years. Uh, Baroness Hale, anything to add? Well, I too think that uh, we have answered those questions uh, previously and I'd like to emphasize the, the lack of forward planning and a structural framework uh, in uh, the government's uh, response uh, to the pandemic, which would have made the parliamentary role so much simpler and easier. Thank you. Uh, Lord House, I'm going to uh, bring you in this at uh, this stage, if you will unmute yourself. 
Thank you. Can we move to the question of legal certainty, the distinction between what is law and what is guidance, and how uh, citizens may have been able to understand the nature of their responsibilities during this period of, of, of the pandemic. Sometimes the, what, what has been promulgated as guidance has been more restrictive than what has been enacted as law. There's, a, there's a, a letter in the Times today from a person who maintains that uh, on the 30th of November, the Department for Health and Social Care published instructions for how we should behave from today on the basis that they were law, although they had not yet been enacted as law. And then moreover, uh, the author of the letter maintains, and I haven't read the document, that uh, what would be law is actually labeled as guidance. So there's, there's ripe scope for confusion. What are your views as to um, <coughs> how public health guidance has been promulgated and whether it's been done in a, in a constitutionally appropriate way by the government during this period? Uh, Baroness Hale, would you like to go first on that one? Well, uh, certainly in the early stage of the uh, lockdown, uh, there was huge confusion as to what was law and what was guidance. Uh, it took a lot of digging uh, to find out which were the regulations to begin with, for the reasons that we explored earlier, that nobody had mentioned the public health regulations. And eventually one looked at the regulations and one saw what they said, and then one looked at the guidance and the guidance purported uh, both to interpret those regulations and to give guidance as to how they should be applied, uh, applied not only by the people who were trying to do their best, but also by the people who were enforcing them. And I think there is every reason to believe that some of the enforcement because remember, these regulations introduced only in enforcement powers will have been used in respect of things that were not actually in the regulations, but only in the guidance. Uh, and that's clearly inappropriate. And uh, the government must always make a clear distinction between what is law uh, and what is merely advice about how people should be behaving. And, and I think that's the almost the clearest moral to come from all of this sorry state of affairs. Lord Sumption. Uh, I agree with that. I am all in favour of the government <coughs> giving advice um, uh, uh, to, to people. Indeed, I think in many ways, uh, uh, advice uh, is a more desirable way of dealing with this than the criminal law. Uh, but when the government does give advice, I think that uh, two things are absolutely essential. One is that the advice should be absolutely objective. It should not be couched uh, in a way that, for example, Sage on the 22nd of March advised that it should be. It should not be couched in a way that is designed to cause fear and alarm for the purpose of inducing compliance. Um, uh, it should be balanced, it should be measured, it should be expressed uh, in uh, 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 unemotional tones, as indeed has been the case outside this country, for example, in France and Germany and in Italy, where I have seen broadcasts by senior ministers, uh, 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 which are in terms that are altogether more measured than those that we have had in some cases uh, from spokesmen for our own government. The second requirement is that it should be absolutely clear what is guidance and what is law. Uh, I think that the situation has, as Lady Hale has said, uh, it somewhat improved in that the guidance is more clearly labelled as guidance and less tendentious now than it originally was. I think a big improvement was produced as a result of the publication in April by the College of Policing of a very clear uh, and very valuable statement, which was to be delivered to every constable, uh, of exactly what the public could do and what they couldn't. For instance, there was a huge amount of confusion about the two metre rule, which has never had any legal force in England, although it has in Wales. Um, 
the, there the police were enforcing the two metre rule uh, in circumstances where until the College of Policing produced its guidance, there was absolutely no legal basis for it. Uh, I regret to say that although the position has improved, uh, it is still happening. Uh, for example, uh, government uh, uh, guidance on the government website uh, currently describes a number of things in terms of must, which I would regard as a statement that it was a legal requirement, which are clearly not, e.g. Uh, the provision of personal services uh, uh, in the home, such as um, hairdressing, for example, uh, which are not prohibited by the um, regulations, uh, but which the guidance says is prohibited. Uh, this is not a satisfactory state of affairs, and although it's rarer now than it was, it should disappear altogether. Uh, Lord House. Sometimes uh, the law has been changed at an hour's notice or very little more. Do you think that's acceptable in the circumstances of an emergency, or do you think there are lessons to be learned in that respect as well? Well, Sanction. I don't think it's ever acceptable uh, for... Uh, regulations of this complexity in any circumstances to be introduced at 20 minutes notice, uh, which was the case uh, with the regulations that were introduced in place of the lockdown at the beginning of July. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that it is a basic characteristic of law uh, that it should be available to the public, uh, that they should be capable of informing themselves if necessary with the assistance of legal advice as to what obligations it imposed upon them. Uh, and there is no emergency, uh, which I think justifies uh, the publication of regulations, which cannot be regarded as law in that sense uh, uh, at that short notice. Uh, Baroness Hale, do you wish to yeah. add anything? No, well, it's, it's quite obvious, isn't it, that uh, it could easily have been planned in advance the government had all those months of the first lockdown in which to decide what it was going to do afterwards and if it had had a fully worked out framework much closer to the one that we have now but not necessarily the same in substance uh, it would have been completely unnecessary uh, to introduce things at such short notice and it's difficult to understand why it was thought necessary then so i agree okay Baroness Fuchs, did you want to come in at this stage? Yes, please, Lord Chairman. Um, I have found the term guidance a somewhat slippery term when you try to define it. Um, would our two witnesses care to define what it is meant and does it have any legal force? It has no legal force, mm -hmm. save in so far as it coincides with what's in the regulations. Um, the government's view of guidance may not be quite the same as mine, indeed it clearly isn't, but I think that guidance is valuable when it consists of informed advice, um, uh, particularly when the origin of that advice is specialists, scientists and so on, and it consists of informed advice of value to citizens. Uh, I don't think that guidance is a process of urging and hectoring, it is a process which is designed to convey balanced information. Baroness Hale? Well, of course, that's, that's correct. Uh, when it's addressed to uh, members of the public, there can be um, circumstances in which a particular individual, an employee or an official, is legally obliged to follow the guidance given uh, by uh, the employer or whatever, or superior, even though uh, it's not in general regulations which affect the whole population. Uh, but that's a different situation from the one that we're talking about at the moment. Um, and it ought to be clear to everybody that this is just advice that the government is giving to all of us. And in fact, that advice covers some of the most important things. You know, of the mantra, hands, face, space uh, in England, hands and space are not the law, but they're just very sensible guidance. 
face coverings are the law in certain uh, circumstances. Uh, and uh, people should understand uh, what the status of that advice is. But of course, it's very sensible advice and we should all try and follow it. Agnes Fuchs, did you want to come back? Um, are you happy for us to move on? Could I ask a supplementary question? Yes, uh, fine. Uh, yes, fine. That's fine. Alan, uh, Lord Beath. Are there not examples uh, in the regulations of instances where a business providing a service is required to have complied with the guidance? Well, that, that, yes, Aaron, that yeah. is probably the case. Mm. Uh, Baroness Fuchs, are. were you, sorry, sorry, I was just trying to clarify yeah. whether Baroness Fuchs wanted to come in. Uh, no, she's gone on mute, it's fine. Uh, Lord Sumption. Uh, uh, mm. uh, yes, is the answer to the um, uh, mm. question. Uh, there are circumstances Lord Beath, are you wanting to come back? Uh, no. you're, you're happy with that. Uh, right, let's go to Lord Dunlop then. Uh, thank you. Um, Baroness Hale has mentioned the bewildering flurry of regulations and the lack of a proper framework. Uh, of course, today we're back in a new tiered system of restrictions with a promise to try and move to a more targeted approach with less broad areas of coverage as we go forward. So given the likelihood of an even more complicated picture nationwide, can I ask each of our witnesses how the government can make sure the new requirements are clearer and more accessible to the public? Thoughts on that? Baroness Hale. Baroness Hale, please. Baroness Hale, would you like to have some thoughts on that? Have you thoughts on that? Um, well, people should be told where they can find out what they need to know, uh, and what they are told uh, when they can find when they find it out ought to be clear and accurate. Uh, one of the difficulties is that uh, you need to go on the internet in order to find out most of this stuff. And sometimes it is the BBC website rather than the government website that has the clearest information. Uh, and that seems to me to be unacceptable, but also have to be ways in which the uh, members of the public who do not have access to the internet can find out exactly uh, what the position is in their area. Um, Another, another thing that has changed from the previous um, st state of affairs was that it is th the position about travel between different um, mm. areas in different tiers has been made rather clearer in the most recent uh, regulations, uh, rather more draconian in fact, but at least it's clear. Uh, Lord Sumption. Um, I think that there is a dilemma here um, uh, the problem is that uh, the simplest way of legislating, though it's also among the most unsatisfactory, is to have one size fits all rules. <clears throat> they are easy to understand, but they are usually going to be a great deal more intrusive and draconian than they need to be. The alternative approach, which is what the Prime Minister has now described as granularity, involves dealing differently with as many different situations uh, as legislative draftsmen can provide for. If you do the latter, you may well achieve a more accurate legislative treatment of the problem, but at the expense of complexity uh, and uh, comprehension. Uh, I think that this is one of the major problems about the use of the criminal law as a mode of policy implementation mm. and social discipline. It may be uh, that the uh, differences between one place and another and between one kind of person and another are simply too complex to be accommodated by law, which 
uh, is sometimes rather a blunt instrument. Uh, Lord Wallace, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, there? following up on from that, I mean, clearly, as has been indicated, you've got divergence between different tiers within England. I'm sitting in a level one area in Scotland. And I just wonder uh, if you've been able to look at the legal divergence uh, between within England and also between the different constituent parts of the United Kingdom, if you think there are consequences of that, and if you've been able to make any assessment of the different statutory bases for regulations in the constituent countries, and whether there's been better parliamentary scrutiny in one part of the United Kingdom or another. Big question. Um, Baroness, Hall, we, uh, Baroness Hale, were you indicating? I was indicating that uh, I very much regret, Lord Wallace, that I have not studied uh, what has been going on in Scotland uh, to the same extent that I have studied what has been going on in England. Yeah. Uh, no disrespect, but that just is uh, the uh, nature of, of the uh, facilities available uh, to me to do that. And so I wouldn't like to comment on whether uh, things are, uh, are better. The only comment one can make, of course, is that it is a serious difficulty that uh, these powers are uh, devolved in the sense that it means that there are differences between uh, the four parts of the uh, United Kingdom uh, in this respect, which makes it uh, very hard for people who uh, live in one part of the United Kingdom, but work in another or have good reasons to go to another part of the United Kingdom. And it must make their lives even more complicated than they are if they stay within their own part. Uh, and so that is a problem, uh, but it is a result of devolution. And I'm not in any way here to criticise devolution. Lord Sumption. I think the potential for differences between the parts of the United Kingdom is, as Lady Hale points out, inevitable, uh, given that health is a, uh, a devolved issue in uh, the three non-English jurisdictions. Um, I think, therefore, that really one is looking at a political issue, namely what measure of cooperation and agreement should there be between the devolved governments uh, and the government of the United Kingdom. Uh, the uh, differences between these jurisdictions is not simply confusing, as Lady Hale has said. Uh, it tends to suggest to the public uh, that the uh, measures themselves are more arbitrary than they necessarily are. Um, and I regret to say that there is also a certain element of point scoring between the jurisdiction, which may have encouraged a desire to create differences that were unnecessary. The jurisdictions have agreed on what to do over Christmas. Uh, I think it would have been perfectly possible with uh, maybe more goodwill than actually exists uh, for them to agree on an altogether wider basis at a much earlier stage. Lord Wallace, did you want to... No, no I, just, I just want to say no criticism of Lady Hale. I perfectly understand that, uh, um, that you wouldn't necessarily have, have, have made that, that assessment. Uh, so no criticism attended. <laughs> OK. Uh, Lord Howe, did you want to come in on, on, on in this area? I, I hope um, helpfully. I just really th thinking about what we're hearing now, that this is actually the... As I said earlier, it's not the first time in history we have plagues and pandemics, but it's the first time in history we've had a totally digitalized society. I think 94% of the population of the United Kingdom have got um, iPhones or iPads or some kind of connectivity, and probably 94% have got their own opinions. So it's never been like this before. And no government has ever attempted before in history to exert the control over people's movements and habits and behavior in the way they have. Are we being proportionate in our search for clearness and accessibility um, when the whole system is full of questioning of everything? I mean, BBC was mentioned. The BBC every morning produce what they call interview questions, but in fact, their opinions challenging everything that's come out of government, everything that's come out of parliament. I listen to LBC in the morning. It's full of granular British common sense, 
of a wonderful kind, but it, it questions and throws into doubt every single regulation and proposition and guidance that is coming, coming forward. Are we not demanding too much by seeking to try and embrace this all in some kind of orderly law? Uh, Lord Sumption. I think that there is no limit to the amount of debate uh, that uh, we should allow, because I think that all disagreement uh, uh, is healthy, and that even applies to the kind of uh, disagreement uh, which is not necessarily well informed, but reflects widely held prejudices uh, that I think should be known uh, to politicians, uh, whether they agree with them or not. Uh, I do not think that there is any problem at all about the idea that people debate this sort of thing furiously. Uh, uh, I don't think that it has an adverse effect uh, on decision making. I think that so far as this has any effect on decision making, it is probably a desirable one. Baroness Hale, do you want to comment in this area? All I want to say is that I agree with what Lord Sumption has just said. Uh, but of course, it, debate is better if it is balanced debate, uh, so that if uh, people come up with some uh, particularly challengeable ideas, there is somebody there to challenge it. Uh, but I think we've all learnt a lot from the uh, debate and exchange of opinions that there has been over these extraordinary times. Um, and uh, long may that uh, tradition continue. But there are some uh, difficult uh, and worrying areas where conspiracy theories do tend to take off on social media that do cause us great deal, many problems further down the line. Um, Lord Sherburn. Thank you. I wonder if I can um, look ahead beyond the present crisis to um, possible future emergencies that may arise. And I wonder if I could clarify something which both the witnesses have said when they were talking about amending the uh, Public Health Act and the Civil Contingencies Act in order to allow for greater um, parliamentary scrutiny and a uh, better way of, 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 of Parliament uh, overseeing the uh, legislation. Uh, um, but my question is this, would they like the any uh, amended legislation that they've been uh, thinking about to have um, residual emergency powers for the government so the government could move very quickly in some future unpredictable emergency um, or would they feel more comfortable with the government then having to bring in primary legislation which would allow um, greater parliamentary scrutiny and capacity for amendment? Lord Sampson? Um, I think that the Civil Contingencies Act does in fact achieve uh, all of those objectives. Uh, it provides for cases that are too urgent uh, for uh, any delay, uh, but subject to uh, parliamentary endorsement within seven days. It covers a very wide range um, of emergencies, um, not just health crises, although that's specifically included, but anything causing a general breakdown of public order or any kind of, of external threat. So that it, uh, I think that it supplies everything that the government needs. The important point is to stop its useful provisions for scrutiny from being evaded. But I entirely agree, if I may say so, with the premise of the question. Even if you look only at public health issues, we have to look at the fact uh, that um, Europe has been extraordinarily fortunate over the last century to have escaped most, though not all, of the major pandemics of highly infectious diseases that have affected the rest of the world. Uh, there is no particular reason why Europe should have escaped that. It simply has done. And we must expect that this good fortune will not necessarily continue so that that readiness for the next occasion is extremely important. Baroness Hale? Yes, I was going to say exactly the same, that in fact, the Civil Contingencies Act uh, 
does all the things uh, that one might want it to do. Uh, and uh, therefore, the best uh, solution, uh, in my mind, would be to remove the restriction uh, on its application where there is other available uh, legislation. Uh, and uh, then let it uh, cover all of these sorts of uh, situations with the safeguards that it has uh, contained within it. Thank you. Uh, Lord Sherburn, was there anything you wanted to follow up? No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, we'll go to uh, Lord Falks. Thank you, uh, Baroness Taylor, and uh, good morning to both of you. Um, you've been very clear about the inadequacy of the a government's approach in terms of their legal um, uh, analysis and the way they uh, got off on the wrong foot and continued really on the wrong foot. But even with the satisfactory approach legally at the beginning, there were some very difficult questions of principle which had to be considered by this government or any government. Uh, I'd like uh, you to help us, if you would, as to how those principles should be approached, reconciling uh, public health, economic interests and the like. Uh, for example, you, uh, Baroness Hale, I think in your recent very helpful lecture at Oxford, thought that the matter ought to be perhaps approached through the European Convention on Human Rights. And I'd like to ask you about that. And also, Lord Sumption, I'd like, like to ask you if, if there were ever circumstances in which you thought that lockdown would be uh, acceptable. Uh, Baroness Hale first thing. That was the first part of your question. Yes. Uh, well, I have suggested uh, that the um, framework of rights and the hierarchy of rights contained in the European Convention is a helpful way of looking at uh, these sorts of um, regulations, which do involve the invasion of fundamental rights uh, to a very considerable degree. Now, that doesn't stop there being very difficult judgments to be made, um, because of course, uh, most of the relevant rights uh, which have been interfered with, though not all of them, uh, are uh, qualified rights. And so they can be interfered with if it is a proportionate response uh, to uh, meeting a legitimate aim. Uh, and judgments about proportionality are of course, extremely difficult uh, to make. And they are in the first instance for politicians to make them and government to make them, and only in the second instance for the courts to um, uh, oversee those. Uh, and they can disagree, but they mostly don't disagree. Certainly the Court of Appeal has recently not disagreed with any of the uh, government's judgments on those rights. But I still think that it's a very useful framework for looking at it. Do we really need to do that? Is the interference with people's um, private lives, is the interference with their economic lives uh, actually justified to the extent that it has gone on? It is a, a, a good framework of principle, it, it seems uh, to me. Uh, Lord Sumption. I, I broadly agree with that. Uh, I have concerns about aspects of the Human Rights Convention, uh, but I think that what Baroness Hale is saying, uh, and what I would certainly agree with, is that the conceptual framework involved, whether it's for the courts or for politicians to decide, is a useful one. In other words, you look at what the rights are and whether interference with them is proportionate. It's worth pointing out that the Public Health Act does actually have a requirement that the Secretary of State should be satisfied that they are proportionate uh, he has included a statement of his satisfaction on that point in every regulation. Opinions may differ uh, about uh, whether uh, they are proportionate, but that's another issue. Uh, in answer to uh, uh, Lord Fawkes' question addressed to me, are there any circumstances in which I think that a lockdown uh, would be um, <coughs> uh, 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 acceptable? Uh, my answer in one word is yes. Uh, I do not believe that liberty is an absolute value, but I do believe that it is a very, very high value, that it is the basic foundation of human happiness and creativity. Uh, and I think that an extremely weighty case needs to be made uh, before uh, it is uh, curtailed. Um, 
I think also that it is often necessary to distinguish between different degrees of vulnerability. Uh, and that may mean uh, that uh, it is justified in some sectors of the population, but not in others. But that's a, a position that we need to think about. Uh, Lord Fawkes, did you want to come back? I know Lord Hennessy wants to come in in a moment. Oh, Lord Hennessy, come in. Fine. Lord Hennessy. Thank you. I was fascinated and stimulated by your lectures, Lady Hales Romani's lecture and Lord Sumption's Freshfields lecture, very much stimulated by them. And I'm sure that as long as historical accounts are written of what we've been looking through, there'll be classic texts. I was very struck by, in Lord Sumption's lecture, his Hobbesian passage. He, you seem very cross, Lord Sumption, with the British people for allowing so much of their liberty to be syringed away by the government in return for security. And I was also very struck in Lady Hale's lecture by her quoting Lord Atkin in the war, that um, amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. But do you not think that one other way of looking at the dilemmas that Lord Sumption examines in his lecture in particular is to the other great Lord Atkin line from the 1932 case involving the lady with the dead snail in her bottle of ginger beer. This snail had made it his more to die in this bottle of ginger beer, which infected the lady concerned who won the case. And Lord Atkin pr produced the sentence, didn't he, the line, the duty of care, which has ever since suffused the mainstream legal discussion in this country. Do you not think that what's going on is individuals are sovereign in the sense they have their own sense of duty of care to those around them and to their community, but also a wider sense of, 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 of the duty of care to, their, to the whole community and the whole country. And then if you're a secretary of state or a prime minister, or anybody in the relevant cabinet committees, you have a very, very distinct duty of care to see the thing in the round. So that rather than getting cross with them, Lord Sargent, the Hobbesian deal that they've done, do you not think you might be slightly more understanding of the impulse of a duty of care, which is quite natural to people, without the need to be, them to be coerced into thinking that or frightened by scientists? I am not cross with my fellow citizens. Uh, I do think that they have uh, made a serious mistake, which is not the same thing. Uh, I think that the problem is that, that we are a great deal more risk averse uh, now than we were in earlier generations. The points that I made about the Hobbesian bargain is essentially that the more risk averse you are, the more you find yourself voluntarily conceding powers to the state. Uh, which involve the use of mass coercion against your fellow citizens. Now, I, I think that this is a serious issue, because as I've said on more than one occasion, um, despotisms arise not because rights are trampled on by tyrants, they arise because people voluntarily surrender their liberty in the way that Hobbes said all people do. In a risk-averse society, the danger is that because there are always risks, and risks are a normal part of human existence, we will always be in a situation where the government will be able, with substantial public support, to curtail those risks by also curtailing liberty. Uh, and I think that this is far too open-ended uh, a structure, uh, and that some curtailment by law uh, of those powers is required. Baroness Hale. Baroness Hale. I think I'm not going to make. Sorry. I think I'm not going to make any comment on those last observations. Uh, if you forgive me, uh, Lord Hennessy. Absolutely, your privilege, uh, Lord Hennessy. You wanted to come back though, and then I think Lord Panic wants to come in. Try and tell Lady Hale already, because it's a very fundamental question. <laughs> I don't think Lady uh, Baroness Hale is going to be tempted. To Never mind, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let me bring in Lord Panic then. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, in answer to Lord Folks, um, each of you uh, said that uh, emergency powers of this nature should only be used where necessary and proportionate, having regard to the importance of individual liberty. Uh, if we as a committee are going to be proposing amendments to the Civil Contingencies Act, would it help 
to propose uh, including uh, such a provision uh, in the Act, or is it so obvious that it doesn't need to be said? Uh, Lord Sumption? Uh, I don't think it's so obvious that it doesn't need to be said. Uh, proportionality uh, as a general legal requirement for the exercise of public powers has, as Lord Panic knows and has often said, um, has uh, become a more significant part of the law uh, with each year that passes. But we are not yet in the position that it is a general requirement of the law as opposed to a requirement of, for the exercise of certain powers, notably those uh, uh, which uh, arise from the Human Rights Act. So I think that it is desirable uh, that it should be included as a statutory requirement, uh, as indeed it already is in the case of the Public Health Act. And I think that applies not only to public health emergencies, but to all the emergencies uh, and a very wide range of them, which are covered by the CCA. Uh, I think Lord Howe wants to come in here. Uh, you're muted, Lord Howe. There we are. Th thank you so much. We are getting into very deep areas, but here we are on the one hand arguing that um, people are surrendering their powers to Leviathan. Um, in, the, in exchange for security and safety and other things. But on the other hand, all our societies visibly are developing colossal centrifugal tendencies. Localism is the rage, separatism is the rage. Um, refuting the central authorities and calling it out of touch is the most common phrase almost in the English language. I mean, it seems to me that there are two completely contradictory tendencies going on here. I'm just wondering whether our old philosophical frameworks, of which we've tried to operate since the Enlightenment, really are adequate to deal with what is happening in a totally new pattern of society in which our inner consciousness has been penetrated by technology and people are simply behaving in completely different ways. I'm not sure whether that's a question or, or, is, or a comment is. that you it's, would like to, to take up. Well, uh, assumption, I'm, though, I... I uh, I'm, I think it follows on some of what you were I'm saying. not sure that I would agree with Lord Hull's <laughs> diagnosis. Um, I think that there are some respects uh, in which uh, uh, society is uh, centrifugal, uh, as he puts it, and some in which they are centripetal. For example, people are uh, very much minded uh, to criticise the government's in many ways and to rubbish things they have done, whether justifiably or not. Uh, but they also rely on central governments to intervene to limit risk in a far wider range of circumstances. And the far greater technical capacities which government has in the 21st century, by comparison with the position even half a century ago, means that it is possible to ask of government an altogether wider range of intrusive measures than was previously the case. Now, that is new. What is new is the greater capacity, technical capacity of governments to intervene. I don't accept that there's anything new about the tendency of the population uh, to criticize. I think that the best corrective to the historical view expressed by Lord Howe is to go and look at some Rowlandson cartoons from the end of the 18th century because I think that they're not only very fine cartoons, but they actually express the carping character of public opinion, which has always been true of every society. If you look at the, the graffiti uh, in uh, the ruins of Pompeii, you will find that they are far ruder than anything that appears even on the internet today. Uh, Baroness Hale, do you want to come in on this? Uh, could I just uh, come in uh, to add something um, in response to Lord Panic, because he was asking about the Civil Contingencies Act yes. and proportionality. The Civil Contingencies Act already requires the minister making the regulations to be satisfied that they're compatible with the convention rights. And so it, the act already contains 
the very framework that I'm suggesting we should be looking at these uh, regulations uh, in. Uh, so uh, I think you don't need to um, recommend amendments to the Civil Contingencies Act for that purpose. Um, as far as uh, centrifugal and centripetal questions are, are concerned, uh, Yes, there are some which go one way and some which go the other way. Uh, but I would entirely agree with Lord Sumption uh, as to the um, 18th century cartoonists' uh, capacity for causing enormous offence to those in power. Uh, uh, but great delight to the rest of us. I have quite a few Gilray cartoons and the odd Rowlinson one as well. Uh, and uh, uh, they give me great pleasure whenever I'm feeling particularly cross with something that's happened. You must look at them a lot of the time then in present circumstances. <laughs> um, Lord Howard, you wanted to, to come on, I think. Yes, prompted by, by Lord Hull talking about contradictory requirements that the public make of politicians. There's another contradiction, isn't there, arising really from, from the conduct of politicians over many years. Um, I mean, on the one, on the one hand, you know, government has a political party promised the people health, happiness, even immortality. And the public demand that uh, these fantasies should be fulfilled and they're quite happy for governments to act in authoritarian ways where the behavior of others are concerned. But equally, when it comes to what it's now fashionable to refer to as granularity, when it comes to their own particular situation, um, people reclaim their freedom and indeed demand the right to behave in anarchic ways. I and mean, Lord Sumption has somewhat anticipated this question, but uh, I wonder what your reflections are on that. Other thoughts, Lord Sumption? Well, I entirely agree. Uh, uh, I agree with both the general uh, statement about our tendencies, but I think that they're inevitable, and also about the way in which they are aggravated <laughs> by the auction of promises that happens every five years. Indeed. Um, Lord Fouts, I think you had uh, a different question that you wanted to end on. Well, actually, I, I, if I may, Baroness uh, Taylor, I wanted to ask a question really arising out of this rather than this particular debate. Okay. I, I think, um, Baroness Hale, in your Romani's lecture, you said you were surprised that there hadn't been more litigation yet. We know there's been the Dolan decision which may find its way up to the Supreme Court. I wonder if you've got any general observations, and indeed you, Lord Sumption, about the role the courts might have in uh, patrolling this uh, particular amount of legislation and regulation which has followed from the pandemic. Baroness Hales, do you want to respond? Well, yes please. Um, there are two roles. The one that was in issue in the Dolan case was in relation to the validity of the regulations. It was argued that they were ultra vares of the Public Health Act, and it was also argued that they were incompatible with the convention rights. And there were arguments about um, ordinary common law principles of public law activity as well. Uh, the Court of Appeal has concluded that the regulations are valid. Who knows what the uh, Supreme Court might decide, but that's one role, and it's obviously an important role uh, for the courts to rule on the validity of delegated legislation. But there's another role, which is to adjudicate upon alleged violations of convention rights in the shape of individuals and what individuals have suffered, uh, which might be, for example, incarceration in conditions which were contrary to the requirements of Article 3 of, of the Convention. Now that is, uh, that is the thing that surprises me the most, uh, in that there don't seem, as far as I know, to have been many cases brought by individuals claiming that their Convention rights have been violated. Um, it doesn't surprise me that there haven't been many claims about the regulations and their validity because of the bewildering <laughs> rapidity with which the regulations have been changed, uh, which has meant that uh, any challenge to them becomes academic, as indeed the, the Dolan challenge was academic because the regulations which were under uh, consideration uh, had now uh, been superseded 
So there are two different roles. There are different reasons uh, for thinking that they uh, might be deployed in this situation. Uh, Lord Sumption. Um, perhaps I can make two points in answer to um, Lord Force's question. <laughs> the first is that I think that as Lady Hale has pointed out, there is a difference between the court's function in ruling on the validity of an exercise of a statutory power and its function in ruling on what I might loosely call the propriety of that exercise. I think it is extremely unfortunate that the case law over the last 60 years has tended to elide these two things. And I, for my part, would welcome uh, uh, putting them into separate compartments because they involve completely different exercises involving utterly different questions of constitutional propriety. Uh, I think that the power of the courts to rule on the validity of an exercise of public powers is absolutely fundamental and should not be limited in any way. Um, the power of the courts to consider the propriety uh, of an exercise of public powers is a much more complicated issue, which is, I think, only sometimes constitutionally appropriate. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that, uh, and maybe this is um, too controversial a point to be made in current context, but I shall make it anyway, and you can ignore it if you think fit. Uh, I think that the courts uh, are more sensitive uh, to the political environment uh, than they admit. Uh, and uh, courts very frequently have what I would call their Liversidge and Anderson moments. Liversidge and Anderson was the case in, 19, in uh, 1942 when Regulation 18B, which oh, no. gave the, the government power to intern anybody by ministerial order without having to express any reason other uh, than that the minister was satisfied it was a good idea, I think it is now universally thought that that was a gross aberration and that the dissenting judgment of Lord Atkin was absolutely impeccable. But I have to say that the danger of a Liversidge and Anderson moment of the courts deferring uh, to the executive, even on questions of validity, uh, is a serious one. Uh, and uh, that I don't actually, I'm not going to make any suggestions as how one should deal with it, except that I think that it is a danger to which courts should be very much alive. Well, that's a really interesting point to end on. And if we don't end now and we follow that up, we may be here for a very long time. And I think we've already exceeded the, the time that was allowed for this session. So I will thank both of our witnesses for their contributions and for provoking a great deal of thought this morning. Thank you very much indeed. And I will...